Welcome to the DNX Podcast. My name is Sylvia Christman. I am your host, and I'm here today with Dan Andrews, who has a website called The Tropical MBA. I'm super excited that I got a chance to talk to you today. Welcome. Thanks, Sylvia. It's great to be here. Yeah, this is really exciting. So, Dan, tell me a little bit about, or tell us a little bit about, what is this website, The Tropical MBA, and what compelled you to get it started? Sure. So, in uh, well, we got to go back a long way for this one, but essentially, the website is a podcast that's been put out most Thursdays since two thousand and nine, mm-hmm. uh, and I like that. It's out- most- Thursdays. Most Thursdays. In the early days, we were a little shaky. You know, if the business was busy that week, then no podcast. But lately, we've gotten more professional. We brought a team on board. And so now it's it's every Thursday. And it's really, it's been a passion project the whole way. It started out that way. Um, we wanted to build a location-independent physical products business um, because we that was our skill set. And we wanted to see the world. We wanted to have freedom and flexibility and those sorts of things. And we just, there was nobody on the web. There was just absolutely nobody that we could find. Certainly nobody in San Diego where we lived at the time. And so I like flipped on my microphone one day and I was like, dude, let's just do a podcast. Cause I'm listening to these other sort of at that time, it was like pirate radio, you know, and you would hear like this SEO consultant in like Western New York talking about his five clients or whatever. And I was like, I want to be like that guy. And uh, so I started talking about, how we were developing a product and you know, the next episode would be like, here's how we're going to go to China and get it made and all this stuff. And basically the show started to just document our career. You know, it was like the story of that little business. And over the years it grew to have a staff of 15. Um, we had awesome products. I thought we sold like cocktail bars to Rihanna, Rihanna's people. And, uh, and uh, Adam Carolla's people and we had valet parking equipment and funky looking cat furniture and all kinds of stuff. (laughs) And then in 2015, we sold that business. Okay. And, uh, I wrote a book about it just last week. So I just went out, uh, yesterday. So what's the name of the book? The book's called before the exit. And the idea is, is that, and this is sort of like a full circle moment for me. So I don't know what the next step is, but uh, it feels really good to get the book done. And here's the basic pitch for the book. Um, when you look online about how to sell a business, mm-hmm. all it's about is the transaction, the numbers, getting a good deal. That might be the case if you're just like, quote, selling a business and like making a transaction. But for a lot of us, if you grow your business for like five or 10 years and have a team, it's part of your identity, you're like, exiting a business. Yeah. That's different. You're, you're changing your whole life. And most of that is emotional. And I don't think entrepreneurs are equipped to deal with that. And certainly the professionals that you'll surround yourself with, they're, they're not going to help you much, right? Like your brokers and lawyers, they really want you to sell, right? They're on team deal because that's when everybody benefits. And so you really need somebody in your corner um, as you start to think about exiting your business. And the book's really designed to be fun, like almost like cocktail party thought experiments that could really be run by any entrepreneur or someone even thinking about starting a business, sort of thinking with the end in mind. Right. That's interesting. So that's, yeah. That's the whole story. So yeah. full circle, it, like from 2009 to what are we, 2008, it's almost been a decade mm. online. Yeah. What's your biggest takeaway from, you know, A, starting the business and then letting go of it by exiting it. What was the number one biggest takeaway? In terms of what? Like, well, what did, what did you learn? You know, like what was the, what was the most impactful thing that you took away from it when you exit it or maybe the most empowering or biggest challenge? That's a great question because it's incredibly difficult. (laughs) Um, Well, you know, it's always the case like you don't know what you don't know. In the case of selling the business, I didn't realize that it would be so challenging Uh, emotionally. emotionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just thought like, hey, this is great. Someone wants to buy our business. We're selling it. This is awesome. This is what every entrepreneur 
dreams of. I've certainly read a lot of articles online about how great of a thing this is. I'm going to put it on my resume. It's going to be on my Twitter bio now. <laughs> exited. Yeah, it's yeah. not on your resume. It's on your Twitter bio. Let yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. Let me uh, cut the uh, suspense for everybody. Like, no one gives a shit. Yeah. No one cares. Like, I'm. it's something that you really have to deal with. And I think this happens maybe in a lot of special arrangements in your life. Like, when you decide, like, if you're going to get married or if you're going to take on a business partner or if you're going to have a family, like, you don't really get to practice that. You know, it's like these are like decisions that have a lot of consequence and not a lot of repetition. Yeah. And so how can you get people in your corner that have experience and that they're not vested in the outcome in a way that would they will persuade you to go one way or the other? Right. And that's really what I didn't do mm. actively because I didn't think it was a big deal. I just didn't know that there was a problem potentially in store for me. I thought mm -hmm. someone wants to buy. It's the right price. Let's pull the trigger. Right. So that was a big takeaway for me. Yeah. And and so what happened? Do you want to tell us? Like what was that what was it emotionally that was the biggest hurdle, a challenge that you weren't prepared for? Well, we were talking about this before the call. I think for me, I was really sad about it. I didn't know why. <laughs> that was part of it. I was confused. Um I was I regretted um the the way we had valued the business. I thought that we had undervalued it ultimately, but we valued it the way that the market, quote, said it was worth. But it was worth more to me than the market. And there's ways in which I could have gone back and, and done things a little bit differently. But generally speaking, I think when, when we get into online business, there's a lot of gurus out there that are like, hey, your career is inefficient at earning you an income. Well, why? Because you can't, you have to sit in a commute or because you can't travel or because whatever. And so what we do is we're like, yeah, sure. Like I want to get more efficient. Mm -hmm. We quit our careers and we throw that whole thing out and we run at like these automated cash flows or these quote passive incomes or whatever. And what you'll find when you meet a lot of the people who have done that is that they feel really empty and directionless <laughs> because they've sort of thrown the baby out with the bathwater and that even though their career had struggles, it also supplied them with a sense of service and purpose mm -hmm. and a tribe of people to be around and camaraderie and a social connection. And, and so it can be similar when you're sitting there with it. We had 15 people that were like our family, right. you know, and we were looking at it like it was this automated passive cash flow mm -hmm. engine. It wasn't, it was so much more than that. It was our identity. It was who we were. And so those are some things to consider. And uh, if it sounds like a bummer of a topic, it actually can be. And some of the <laughs> biggest, so the the best selling book in the space, which isn't that great of a selling book, I think because entrepreneurs don't recognize the problem. They want to hear a book about how they can double their business or blah, blah, blah. They don't want to think about the fact that every business owner exits, regardless of whether it's because you effed up or whether you died or whether you sold it to someone for a gazillion dollars. Like everybody's going out but no one wants to think about it. So the way I designed the book was to sort of be mm -hmm. fun and to pose these thought experiments that you can think about any time. Like, like what's your number really? You know, how much money do you need to be set for life? And how would you even go about thinking about that problem? And who would you ask for advice? That's like one of the thought experiments in the book. And one of the things that I did, for example, was I underestimated what my number was because I saw a big number and I thought, wow, that's great. But what I found by like going back and analyzing is that it didn't actually get me to a meaningful next level. So like cash in your bank account isn't linear. Yeah. So going from, say you're broke, if you get $20,000, that's amazing. Like that's a big lifestyle change. Now, if you get another twenty to forty thousand dollars, that doesn't change your life at all, really. Assuming you know you have an income source, so that's just like a small representation of like cash isn't yeah. linear, and I don't r really understand that at the time. So, essentially, these are like sort of fun things that everybody can do, and it doesn't need to be such a downer. In terms of the other books in the category, what I've noticed is that the people who recognize their value are the brokers, the lawyers, and the wealth <laughs> managers. They buy them in bulk and give them to their entrepreneur clients and say, hey, dreamer, <laughs> you need to read right. this because <laughs> there's this thing, reality yeah. coming your way. 
Yeah. That is so, yeah. that is a yeah. very, yeah. very important phrase that's been coming around in my orbit a lot lately, and it's the stay in touch with reality and be very clear on what this reality really is. Play it through. You know, play it through emotionally <laughs> and play it, play it through factually because those two will eventually intersect, you know? To be very clear, what's the emotional totally. risk you're taking? How's that going to look and feel? emotionally and what are the facts that we're looking at right that intersection is complex well and one of the things that i've found for me personally is that when i'm in uncharted ter territory it's easy to to borrow from other people to, to borrow their values so now all of a sudden say you're successful and you're this hotshot person that thinks they can sell their business and there's these professional class of people that wear nice clothes and they're successful and they tell you how great you are and all this stuff. It's easy to sort of like buy into that script, yeah. you know, and forget the fact that the reason you got into this in the first place is that you had a clear idea of what you wanted right. to do with your life. And it was very different from what the people in nice clothes around you were telling you. And, and I think I just lost sort of we all do. I certainly do all the time. Like it's not just in this instance, but it's, it's hard to like ask yourself, you know, what do you really want? And that's why I got into this whole game in the first place. You know, what do you really want? Well, at the beginning, it was a matter of, I, I wanted to own my own destiny and I wanted really simple things. Like I remember writing down, I want to live in another country for like months on end at some point in my life. I just want to see like what another country is like. That's where I was at. It was so difficult. I think especially for Americans to leave their country and their career for extended amounts of time. Mm. Maybe that's changing nowadays, thankfully, but certainly during my time in the career, it was like a resume gap was like, don't even say the two dreaded words, you know, the right. fact, and you're, you're just throwing your whole career out the back door if you were to say just go teach english in china for a year something and so it was things like that it's like i, I sort of came to this existential moment was like man i don't even like i'm i don't even own my own life you know i can't even do really basic stuff that i want to do and I, that was my motivation to start the business yeah what do you want now i mean did you find what you were looking for certainly in that sense um you know, the next phase is different. And in which sense did you not find it? I'm just curious. What, what else did you find that you weren't expecting? I think for me in, in my 20s, it was really about like trying to do something big and make a name for myself or like, you know, become location independent and financially free. Not necessarily, maybe when I was younger, I thought that meant rich, but I was pretty quick to realize that like, man, you don't need to be rich to enjoy like all these wonderful freedoms um now the qu what makes you feel rich today what is it well it's the things that money money it's money can't money. buy so you're gonna have to leverage your mobility and your time and your resources to invest in the things that really matter like uh great friendships uh family um respect from your peers doing good work for me, that might mean I love synthesizing ideas and writing. Um, one of my biggest projects every year is uh, our annual New Year's Eve week getaway with my high school friends and like all of their partners. So that's like a big project for me every year because I really value those relationships that are, that are 25, 30 years old now. So yeah, like that's the punchline, of course, is that Money can't buy you any of those things. And you see a lot of that frustration in the business world. You know, people that had business success and they're like really pissed off that people don't respect them or whatever. It's because you can't, you can't buy it. And, but that doesn't mean you're just because you have the flexibility to invest in all those things that you're going to. So that's the challenge I think for the, the next phase for me and, you know, sort of the, I don't know. I'm getting older, so I'm starting to like look at like the second half of my life and thinking this is sort of a different set of goals for me than uh, what, mm -hmm. I, what I had when I was in my 20s. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I, I know that crosses. I think 
you know, freedom in my 20s was defined based on where can I go, what can I do, and how much money can I make. Freedom in my 30s is about, you know, what can I do with the money to enhance my experience in this world, give back, and spend quality time with people I love. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. That's a, that's a thing. It's, it's, it's a much trickier challenge. I mean, if you thought figuring out automated passive income was tough, then wait until you get to like service, community, family, respect, mm -hmm. you know, like those sorts of things are, are tough, tougher. Yeah. We talked about it a little bit earlier that when you, when you walk, work in a company, when you have a job, you know, we, we, we know the limitations that people want to break away from, which is that freedom and money and being able to be location independent. But what are the benefits that people really get from that? Right. It's like every constraint is also a cauldron, you know, that can, yeah. and in the case of careers, what I've noticed is I, I've used this term called exit velocity and it, it was going on in the back of my mind when you were describing your career to me, I was like, Sylvia has a very high exit velocity, which means that when you exited a more traditional career path, you had a, a tremendous amount of skills, connections, experience, and know-how. Yes. And by the way, like know-how is different than know that. People don't find this distinction compelling, but it's it's at the core of so many issues in our community. You do not know how to do something in business if you read an article about it or a book about it. You just don't. It's entrepreneurship is a know how. It's like riding a bike or swinging a bat. You have to like know how to do it. You can't just know of it. Um. So in other words, you got to get in the game and do things. And one of the best ways to do that is a career because they pay you to be there and to do things that are much harder than you would ever give yourself to do. You know, it's like, just to call it like jumping on a fixie bike going downhill, like the pedals are going so fast and you have to get your feet to catch up with it. You were telling me about all the business development stuff you were doing. You would never be doing all that stuff for your niche site and you certainly wouldn't have the resources to do, do it, right? No. Now, no. all of a sudden you're being thrust into this situation where people are saying for you to do impossible things and then they're leaving the room. Right. And you're just sort of sitting there alone with all these resources around you thinking, well, F, I'm going to give it a shot because otherwise I'm going to get <laughs> fired. Now, right. the other thing that's going to happen in a career that's quite useful is that if you're effing up or not playing by legible rules you know, that other people can understand and work with you, they're going to either fire you or sit you down. Like something's going to happen that's going to help mold your personality. And what I've found is it's oftentimes those painful conversations that people join this community to avoid mm -hmm. and then they never have that pain. And then their personal personality say, because sometimes your personality quirk can be a huge strength and you can go out there and you know it can be really great for you. Like there's podcasters that love to talk. <clears throat> and maybe if you have this thing that in conversations, people say, oh, Dan talks too much, but maybe that's good for me if I'm a podcaster. But there's also the dark side of that, which is that there's things that, you know, people don't like working with you. Uh, you don't communicate clearly to people and they're constantly confused when you're around them. There's a lot of these sorts of things that you see manifest in the workplace. What happens online is that people just start to ghost on you or they start to avoid you, or they don't buy your product, or that your clients drop off or whatever. And you never have that tough conversation to figure out what was at the core of it. And so you start to think things like, oh, I'm a failure, or oh, I'm this, or like the market was bad, or my timing was bad. And you never really get to face the truth. And I think that's part of the reason that business partners are so powerful. It's part of the reason that spouses are so popular too, or so powerful as well. Because my business partner can't afford to put up with my shit. Am I allowed to swear? Sorry. Yeah, I think so. I don't know. My, yeah. my business partner isn't, he's not allowed to, he, he can't afford to put up with my crap. Like right. he, it, we have tough conversations. We had one last week and that's really powerful. That's like, that means a lot to me. Um, because without it, I could spiral off into my own little pathology and potentially never recover. So this, now, my big, long soliloquy comes into something that I believe is a decent rule of thumb, which is that if you're not making $100,000 a year from your business and you want to, and that's your goal and aim, all the things between you and there are probably mindset issues. And expand the term. So you're not having like marketing issues. You're not having cash issues. You're not having HR issues. 
you're having mindset issues. And so expand the term mindset a little bit. That could also include personality. You could have a <laughs> I was just going to ask that. Is it, are you sure about the mindset or is it like an attitude? Are we talking about an attitude? It could be. It very much could be. And in fact, well. like, <laughs> right. Because like mindset is like this euphemism, right? But the stuff that really matters is, yeah, your personality. Like you could have this thing about your personality that that really sucks. And that's like holding you back in every interaction that you're ever in. And if you can go sort that out, and it's possible if you can recognize it, mm-hmm. you know, whatever your means are, get a coach, get a, a accountability partner, a business partner, uh, a therapist. And you say, hey, like my clients aren't responding to what I'm saying. Let's sort it out. You know, so I think there's a lot of upside for people that are willing to take a look at that kind of stuff. And to circle back to the very beginning, those are the sorts of of, of pains that not all pain is bad, you know, and those are the sorts of the reason that you have a high exit velocity is because you went through that for so many years. And now all this stuff that you're doing now, it feels easy yeah. because it's like, man, I was so much harder before. Yeah, I want it's so it's it, this to me is such an interesting topic. And thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I know for myself that my character flaws that are the biggest obstacles are also happen to be some of my greatest assets. It just depends on when I apply them. Right. 100 percent. And learning how to be comfortable with that uncomfortable truth of how you, your attitude may affect others or whatever it is in that substance subset of who you are and what allows you to operate with in, in a business or interact with other human beings is going to define how successful you're going to be. But being comfortable. 100%. Yeah, and I think, you know, don't you think that it's about being comfortable with that uncomfortable truth and being able to laugh at it and say, <laughs> okay, here it is again. Because I don't know about you, but I know that the same thing I've known that I was had to sit down I, when, when somebody sat me down and had a talking to me <laughs> about what I was doing wrong. It still shows up all the time. <laughs> well, it might be the case and, and they might have, and this is gets much more complex. So just because someone senior, you thinks that you have a problem doesn't mean they're right. And they might be fabricating the problem in order to control you. So there's, and, and here's what's even crazier is that a lot of these effed up things that we're talking about in your personality, we we all know people that are super successful and super messed up. And so sometimes it's that itself that drives people like a sense of deep inadequacy, <laughs> for example, is one of the things that you'll see in very successful people. Um, they're always trying to uh i had a uh, a friend that recently met with one of the most famous athletes in the world and i won't mention the person's name but what he said was i was like well, what's it like to meet somebody so famous was, i was like wow I and he said it was like he was trying to win the conversation <laughs> <laughs> and i just thought like you could be this person that's so famous and so rich and so successful yet you're, you can't even let some random person that you met get a word in, you know, because, you know, you're just wired that way. So sometimes you don't want to mess with the wiring depending on what you have. I don't know. I'm not an expert in any of these things. It's just some things that I've noticed as, I, as yeah, I've gone along. Very true. Yeah. Oh, I, I can relate to that so much. And I think it's so important for all of our listeners to really consider that because in this day and age, if you go into the era of solopreneurship, you know, it's very hard to get feedback on what's really going on. And you're going to be guessing unless you get a mentor or like you said, a therapist or somebody that can help you undercover what is maybe the mindset. Well, there's, the a, there's, another, yes. there's another way, which I'm sure you've been involved in masterminds yeah. in the past. And so that, so my two businesses now is I facilitate mm-hmm. masterminds and I facilitate small business uh, apprenticeships and hiring. With apprenticeships, I believe that if you know, you're having a tough time with your business and you're not getting a lot of traction, one of the best things you can go do is work for a small company directly for the founder. And often what will happen is the founder will like put your hands on the wheel and say, steer this thing. And that's a way to get that know-how I was talking about. And plus you're getting paid. And often it is 
those sorts of experiences that'll give you that exit velocity. You'll like bump into your idea or your partner or your next product or whatever. And then maybe even that founder will support you with your, with mm-hmm. your own venture. Certainly that's what happened with me is, is the person that I was the right hand mm-hmm. man for uh, was my yeah. investor right. because he trusted me and I trusted him and it, and it worked. The second thing is masterminds. Um, if you don't have any of these aforementioned things like therapist, partner, whatever, you need to be in a mastermind, I believe. It's like it's almost like a affordable board for your small business, you know? Uh, people to keep you in check, people to get on the phone with every week. And that's why, you know, I don't spend all day long like writing how-to blog posts, although I enjoy those. It's like these are the like the real things that are gonna get, you know, real results, yeah. I believe, in your career. Hundred percent. So those are the two yeah. things that I'm doing. And we will on. put the links uh, to these, this mastermind and, and, and how to find you and get in touch with you below this podcast. Thank you so sure. much, Dan. This was really, really, really exciting. Thank you for making the time. And for everyone else listening, if you have not subscribed to our podcast, yes, please do so. We really appreciate it. Go to iTunes. Go to dnxpodcast.com. Subscribe to us. Leave us a review. Reach out to us. We want to hear from you. And until the next episode. That's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your ongoing support. Before I leave you, I want to invite you into my world. Please go check out dnxcommunity.com. This is where you'll find the other nomads and evaders of convention. We'll see you there. And if you're interested in our English speaking events, go and check out dnxglobal.com. You'll find the link below this podcast as well. And if you have time, one last favor, please go to iTunes, look for Sylvia Christman or look for the DNX podcast and leave a review. Thank you so much, lovely people. And I'll talk to you next time. Bye.